Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mission, we do a lot of work in the media, and we do these roundtables on a regular basis. These are all free. All the content that we provide is for free. These roundtables are for free. This is the 444th session. We've been doing this for more than 10 years. We started in the fall of 2008 with an experiment which led to the founding of One Million by One Million using this online mentoring uh, format. So it's a, you know extensive uh, experience that we've had in using this format of online mentoring for entrepreneurs. The event is being recorded. You will find a recording of this and all our prior sessions on our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtables. On Twitter, we're at 1M by 1M and at Stromana. You can follow us and track all the rich content that we uh, publish, again, free of charge. Uh, if you like tweeting today, please use hashtag 1M1M. And uh, these are the call-in instructions. We are a roundtable. This is not a broadcast. It's a roundtable. We want you to participate as much as possible and uh, you know, get to know you, hear about your issues, as well as hear about your thoughts on what's, happened, what's being discussed in each of these sessions. So by all means, dial in a little bit later in the program. In the meantime, while we have the scheduled programming going on, use the public chat to dialogue and participate as well. Today's session, we're going to have Hernan Fernandez from Angel Ventures in Mexico as our first guest. Hernan, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Sermana. Thank you for the invitation. Very excited to join. All right. Well, let's uh, get to know you and let's get to know Angel Ventures Mexico. Tell us about the fund. Tell us about your activities. Where do you invest? What, uh, what size fund do you run? And let's, uh, let's just get you introduced to our audience. Uh, absolutely happy to. So our story actually starts off in 2008. Um, me and my, my partner at the time, we, we, we were in MIT, and, you know, we just got completely sucked into the amazing venture ecosystem that goes on there. And what, uh, what prompted you to get uh, going with this? Were, oh, you, yeah. were you studying you know, at MIT in 2008? Yes, I was studying at MIT between 2005 and 2007, and okay. there basically, you know, uh, engaged with the venture mentoring ecosystem and, and you know, participated in the business plan competitions, et cetera. So it was just mm -hmm. like a, such a dynamic ecosystem that I completely and absolutely fell in love with. Um, I, yeah. I actually started like, helping Mexican entrepreneurs raise some money or linking them to MIT, et cetera, and, and I just, like, love living, being part of that. Um, then in 2007, I came back to Mexico. I took a job in consulting, and I was a miserable consultant, I must say. And, uh, and, and, you know, I, I still have, uh, you know, I, I have been receiving emails of founders or, or uh, you know, even some investors saying, hey, you know, I, I would like to, to see more private, et cetera. So basically I decided to, to start the first angel investment in Mexico. That's why our names. So between 2008 and. Go ahead. 2000. 2000. When did you start in the venture? 2008. 2008. Yeah, we, we run the Angel Network exclusively from 2008 to 2013. And in 2013, we raised our first fund. So it was a 20 million US dollar fund. We had mm -hmm. 56 limited partners. It was three institutional investors, the Inter-American Development mm -hmm. Bank and the Mexican Development Bank. And 53, you know, of our first crop of angel investors that believed in the project. Uh, that okay. was a pretty successful fund. We we had some follow-on investments by you know the GA, SoftBank, the Masic, and and you know trying to 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 really recreate a good thesis in, in Mexico. We we were in the middle of the fintech wave, which was absolutely amazing. We had some very successful fintech companies coming from that maiden fund, and now we we manage our second fund, which is a fund for the Pacific Alliance countries of Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru. 
we feel it's a great and tough opportunity. These four countries, which, you know, they're very closely aligned together, uh, mm -hmm. they have 230 million people and an economy of $2.2 trillion uh, U.S. So it's larger mm -hmm. than Brazil. It's actually larger than Canada uh, in terms of economy and, well, in terms of population, of course. Uh, so, yeah. you know, there's, there's so much to be done here. Uh, we're big fans of comparable markets. So we, we travel extensively through other countries like India or uh, Southeast Asia, Middle East, North and Africa, and we just see the trends that we're seeing right now, which you yeah. know, I think we're on the on the brink of something in terms of global emerging market play. Global entrepreneurship, which, yes, which is absolutely which, our mission as well. So um, let yeah. me ask you a few questions just to understand the, um, the dynamics of the Mexican ecosystem. Um, you said you moved you started in 2008 with the Angel Network in Mexico. I presume that at that point you moved from Cambridge to Mexico, yes? That is correct. So who are these angel investors? Does that include technology investors or is it more, uh, you know, other industries, people who have made money in other industries and are interested in investing in technology? So, Ramana, that's an amazing question. You know, you're, you're spot on because we learned the hard way that angel investors are so different to the, so different to the ones that you will find in the U.S., Europe, or the developed right. countries. Whereas in the U.S. or Europe, 80% of angel investors have been successful entrepreneurs in Mexico yeah. and in Latin America. That, that's certainly not the case. So the pockets yeah. of money are actually more tied to all, all their money. You know, it's, it's people that have been wealthy all their lives and probably their fathers and grandfathers have been wealthy as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, what, what we found was that there's, there's an emerging trend of successful businessmen, right? I'm, I'm talking about this, the C-suite levels and the CEOs, CTOs, McKin McKinsey partners, you know, the Goldman Sachs employees that we're starting to see entrepreneurs as an investment opportunity. So you go yeah. from real estate to even some franchises, et cetera, and, you know, in 2008, for the first time, we started seeing that many year-end bonuses and things like that were going towards entrepreneurs, and we saw it as a fascinating trend. Obviously, this has to do a lot with age. You know, we're talking people between 25 to 45, maybe, at, at their core. And what we saw, and what, which was an opportunity for a fund, and our first fund was actually a co-investment fund, was that the tickets were, were significantly smaller from what you would see in an angel in the U.S., but the key, the key insight was that this was actually smart capital, and that was was actually locking. So uh, by having the, you know the, the the country manager for Google or the country manager for Pfizer, they were able now to finally do some smart investments in many of these verticals. So our job yeah. at that point in time, and it still is, it's to empower these individuals to become successful yeah. in, in investors. And Angel Ventures has actually produced funds that co-invest with these individuals. We leverage many of these individuals and their expertise into our fund screening and sourcing and, and investment processes, and we, yeah. we perceive ourselves as a, a as a real time, a, you know, like co investment a, a mechanism of sorts to to fund the best mm -hmm. entrepreneurs that we can find in our countries. Interesting, very interesting. Okay, so. Um, now, you said you invest in Mexico, Chile, Peru, and um, Colombia. Colombia. And are the angel investors also from all four uh, countries, or are they all Mexican investors? No, actually, we, we have a very broad base of angel investors. We have 15 nationalities represented throughout our base and our angel okay. base. We have many investors from the U.S., some from Canada. I would say the core is certainly Mexico and Colombia. It might be like a, like a close second. <laughs> some guys from Peru, okay. some from Chile, Guatemala. But we, we even have, uh, you know, Germany, Spain, Japan, uh, Thailand, uh, Australia. So, you know, it's, it, it's interesting. Many times it's really And how did that come Colombia. together? Uh, you know, I, you probably know this. I'm also an MIT alumni. Did you, did you, were you able yeah. to leverage the MIT alumni network? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, uh, I mean, th think about, you know, doing sometimes, every, every now and then we get some, you know, deep companies that we have no idea, idea how to how to deal with them, right? So, yeah. I mean, you know, Mexico actually is a pretty interesting country in terms of robotics. So we had no idea how to 
to actually engage with a, the proper robotics company. We could probably, you know, do yeah. it or stop in, in e-commerce or fintech, et cetera. But mm-hmm. when, when we actually see things that they're, they're way above our lead, we basically do things first, try to tap into the MIT network and see who can help us, you know, do a better okay. job at, at, at giving like a fairness opinion to that entrepreneur and linking them to that network. Uh, and in these particular investments, when it concerns like deep tech, we, we rather play second fiddle and po- possibly being more mm-hmm. like a, a follow-on investor. Mm-hmm. Because again, uh, deep tech is, is a global play. And, and I think uh, in what we can be really good and relevant is more in business, business model plays that are more suited to our countries. Yeah, okay. So let's talk about some of the investments you've made. Um, and, and in particular, as you describe these investments and, and the case studies, so to speak, talk about how did you find them, what state did you find them, and what was it about these companies that compelled you to write the check? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think that uh, coming back from the, the, to, to, to what's the story behind, I, I love good storytelling. And, and I must say, you know, that, that uh, the, the best part of being in this job is, you know, being with the most uber-optimistic people out there, which are you know, many times by definition entrepreneurs. So I, I love asking entrepreneurs the question, like, how and why did you get into this industry, right? And if you can see, like, like even at some certain extent, like a personal connection, it's it's beautiful, you know. Uh, for example, I, I uh, Adolfo Barat, he's also an MIT alum, by the way. Um, he's the founder of Clip. I would say it's like the most successful uh, Mexican company today, and you know, it's it's on its, on its route to be a, to become a unicorn. It's got investment by SoftBank and by GA I and mean, some other serious guys, and it's now you know overtaking most banks in in Mexico. And, and, you know, Adolfo used to, pay, to work for PayPal, and he was, like, developing a product, and he felt that, you know, there was, like, something missing. So he worked, you know, in, in a very world-class company trying to develop products, but he knew that he didn't have, like, the, the enough environment to actually make something that worked for Mexico. So he quit mm-hmm. PayPal. He, he was bankrolled by, by his co-founder at the time and, and another employee, and they had, like, a beautiful story together of how to create a big company in Mexico. And again, if you ask Adolfo, you know, you, you knew from day one that Adolfo was passionate about why payments were so bad in Mexico and they were so miserable. And mm-hmm. I, at the time, I had no idea if Adolfo was going to be successful or not, but I knew that he was passionate about what he was building. And, and you know, that, 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 that was a, a pretty good chance we took. And on the other hand, you know, many times we see, you know, like, like a really good sales, salesperson, you know, with a, with a good... PowerPoint presentation and you know, mm-hmm. some hardy balls. And, and you just sense that he's now probably, I don't know, selling to you e-commerce for babies. And if he doesn't get funded, actually this has happened to, to us before, in six months he's going to be raising, uh, you know, an e-commerce for pets. So you kind of mm-hmm. like think where the passion into that and, and uh, you know, if, if things go sour, there, there's a, not, not that stickiness factor that you would like to see an entrepreneur. So we try to to make the best assessment that we can in terms of grit uh, and determination of the entrepreneur. Obviously, besides the size of the market and, you know, the competitive dynamics, regulation, et cetera, which, you know, are, are the usual, but I would say, like, my special take is on the entrepreneur's personal mm-hmm. background story. It's something that's very critical for us. And is fintech a, a, a sector that you have invested more in is that is it's a big trend uh, in Mexico as well? It, it is a globally a big trend right now. Yes, fintech. I uh, we, we were lucky enough to to be you know in the middle of the fintech way. Uh, actually, we, when we designed the fund back in 2013, we had no idea we were going to see fintech deals. But when we started seeing the trends that we were seeing, technology plays that tapped into financial markets, etc. <laughs> okay, guys. We need to build a proper, uh, you know, fintech fintech capacity to to anal- analyze these deals. So yeah, we invested in Clip, we invested in Questly, we invested uh, out of our first fund, which which was 21 companies. Six of them are into the fintech space, and two of the top performers are, are fintechs. So now okay. with our second fund, we're also doing uh, fintech. We we really like it. You know, Mexican banks are are just so. Uh, obviously, they have they have uh, they have been getting better all the time. You know they're, they're just so expensive, and they don't get many times consumer. They, they, um, I, I just feel that it's 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 a right time to disrupt, and 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 the Mexican government has been 
quite supportive, and actually Mexico became the first country to enact a proper fintech law in the world. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, some things we can be innovative, and, and certainly that was the, the one of one of the first. Um, so, so yeah, fintech think is great. Mobility, you know, it's it's, it's one that for for all kind of countries is great. And and for example, I, I would love love to share this on on mobile and one mobility investment that we made. So we invested in a, in a company called Urban in Mexico, which is a B two C slash B two B two C mobility play to take uh-huh. people from you know their house to their workplace, etc. And we did a similar. In- Did we lose her now? Maureen, can you hear uh, Hernan? I cannot hear him anymore. So is it I who lost him or everybody lost his audio? Okay, we all lost his audio. Ah, all right. In that case, I think I'm going to go to Maureen. I'm going to let you work with Hernan to. Hello, uh, Hello sir. Uh, here we go. Yes, we lost you, Hernan. Yes, the call dropped. Uh, so just just to finalize that idea, you know, we invested into these two companies that are doing amazing things in uh, in mobility, and we yeah. went to India and met with with the shuttle team. We love that company. We went. To, we, we actually met with investors of Swivel in uh, from Egypt and from mm-hmm. Vault in uh, in Turkey. And you know what we're seeing it's 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 actually quite interesting in the sense that this is a pure emerging markets play because actually in the at the time there was this company, there was a company called Chariot that was acquired by Ford. But they were solving mm-hmm. a very, you know, a, a, not, not a very important problem in developing the countries, right? Because these these companies deal with mobility for workforce. And if you try to do this in Boston or in, you know, San Francisco, uh, you know, uh, public transportation works quite well. Financing for yeah. cars is very cheap. Uh, and it's, it's not something that you actually need to work on. Whereas in places like India or Delhi or Mexico City or, you know, uh, uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Bogota, you have all these people that are between, uh, you know, public transportation that sometimes can be bad or very inefficient. And the yeah. best next alternative is something like Uber Pool. So there's yeah. so much, you know, uh, opportunities to, to innovate in that space that I'm, I'm mm-hmm. very confident that the unicorn, the first unicorn that we're going to see in that space is probably going to be either Swivel in, in Egypt, uh, Mina, or, or, or shuttle, but, but I think that the Latin American components into that are also be, going to be very dominant. So we're very, very hyped on, on you know, what we can build as, as a pure emerging markets play, and we're going to yeah. see more and more of this coming. Um, and, you know, the trends, you know, it, 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 cash on delivery. It's something that even Amazon have to adapt for cash and delivery in Mexico, which Mexico, by the way, yeah. is the, the fastest market to grow to one billion in sales anywhere in the world. Uh, Uber, mm-hmm. you see, if you saw Uber's, uh, Uber's numbers, 28% of Uber's revenues come from uh, Latin America. So Latin America has the consumers, is, is growing in terms of purchasing power. Very digital consumer. Cert- yeah, exactly. And it's, 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 I, I think it, it was like kind of like left out uh, from the global investment scene. And then, you know, uh, a few months ago, SoftBank committed $5 billion to the region. And we're starting to see more and more activity from the sequoias, the axles, et cetera, of the world. So it's, it's certainly an interesting place to be right now. Very interesting. Okay, cool. Now, um, would you say the bulk of your portfolio is B2C? Uh, good question. I, I would say it's, it's split. I will, I will tilt it more towards B2C, yes, but we do have a few B2B plays as well. Um, I would say fintech is pretty big. We have done some things in e-commerce and learned some hard lessons in the way. You know, some of them mm-hmm. are still doing okay. Uh, mobility, I think, has picked up in terms of what we do. Uh, health and health-related opportunities, all the way from platforms to to some medical devices. Um, and, and yeah, that, that, and, and certainly some B2B plays uh, in, in logistics. And I actually have invested in a very interesting Korean beauty company that's now expanding to Latin America. 
Okay. Interesting. You know, a lot of the B2C trends that you are uh, talking about are trends that are big in India as well. Um, we, we cover India very extensively and uh, for I have for a long time. Um, the Indian B2C market is, is more advanced, I think, than Latin America. But it's Absolutely. also a lot of these trends that you're talking about are very active trends uh, in India as well. And I think that, you know, the, the commonality across all this is that the consumer logistics part is very broken in most of the emerging markets, right? So there's a lot of logistics-oriented stuff that uh, need to get built, and, and venture is a perfect way to build that. A lot of fintech doesn't exist, right? There's the financial services sector is very immature. The healthcare sector is very immature. Retail, organized retail is very immature even. It's, you know, very fragmented retail. Um, all of these are trends, uh, and, and everything that you talked about, cash on delivery is a, is a big trend in India as well. And, and so, so I think it's, these are, the emerging markets have certain commona commonalities. So I guess the question that I would put to you is, have you studied what is different? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, we, we also did our second trip to Bangalore uh, a couple of months ago, and it feels like a playground. You know, the, the energy there, it's, it's amazing. I think Indians are, are very good, and obviously they have a, a more, way more developed uh, financing ecosystem. Uh, we were actually yeah. funny, but we, we got interviewed by, by your story. You know, uh, Shraddha was, was fantastic. And we yeah. met with so many big, uh, companies, you know, very open in terms of, yeah, we're focused in India because it's a huge market. It's growing so fast. Uh, but, but, yeah, you have many of the things that we see prevalent in Latin America, right? Mega cities, you know, the, 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 yeah. how you actually factor into, into those consumers. And, and, and these hacks that Indians have been able to make, are, are you know are something that we are keen on, on on seeing how that develops into into Latin America. Uh, you know, places like things like social commerce, right? Like, like the whole Avon Cosmetics catalog that is very prevalent in, in Latin America as well. And you have people in their you know by hours and office hours uh, just selling to you every you know shoes or whatever. And and Indians have adapted that to towards technology and uh, cash on delivery. It's it's, a, it's a, also a very common one. And again, it's like these local hacks that happen into into developing economies that I think India do Indians do very well. So, uh, so yeah, I, I I think that 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 certainly India uh, where it stands today, it's a very interesting model for Latin America. I will actually say much more than than China. Um, you know, Southeast Asia, it's it also has some pretty interesting company. Mainly, you know, we have seen some amazing companies in Vietnam. We have seen great yeah. things also in Indonesia, uh, but but yeah, India I think has has a very a big concentration of that, and, and Bangalore it's it's a great place to visit for that sense. Well, I think the difference between India and Latin America is that India has this very deep technology industry because it it served as like the back office of American technology companies and IT departments of large companies for so long, for you know good two three decades, and and it developed a huge mass of very tech savvy people so i think the that is yeah. one of the reasons why the b2b and the deep tech side of india is also quite well developed at this point and is developing yeah. even more and very well uh, that i don't think yeah. is true about latin america the latin american market is more b2c uh, opportunities as well as i think there, there are b2b opportunities in latin america as well but it's not as much deep tech it's more um, you know more business models and and inefficiencies that are being addressed through venture. I, yeah, you're, you're spot on. Uh, I think India has, has the, the business model approach, but you're, you're spot on in, in saying that it's a deep tech. And I will claim that, yes, unfortunately, I don't think Latin America is, is deep tech. I'll say two reasons. Obviously, you know, I don't think that, that we have that long-standing, you know, a tradition of, like, like India has had of, you know, capturing so much tech and working for so much tech companies and then relocating yeah. to India and being able to push for that. I would say there are some pockets that we see very promising, like Guadalajara in Mexico has some of the mm -hmm. elements that we feel very confident about, and uh, particularly there, you know, you have the Intel, the Microsoft, and you have these 
nearshoring capabilities that Silicon Valley is using a lot. So I will be very bullish on Guadalajara in the years to come. You have like places like Santiago, you have places like like Medellin. So I think there's, there's certain cities, but obviously not to a certain extent or to a critical mass that, that, that India has, has achieved for sure. And the other thing that I really like is, you know, the, the whole financing thing. If you come to think about it in the top tier U.S. BC funds, there's not many Latins. There's, there's very few Mexicans. Well, whereas that's India right. has a critical mass, right? So yeah, you, that, absolutely. Like, absolutely. That, that, that really helps a lot in terms of funding. And, you know, I, helps a lot. I'm just, you well, know, it helps a lot. I think that the India Silicon Valley bridge has been very powerful and it helps a lot. I don't yes. think that similar Silicon Valley Latin America bridge has been as strong no. or, you know, that, that level of presence of Latin Americans in the higher echelons of Silicon Valley just doesn't exist uh, yet exactly. anyway. So, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, but, so, and the, the, the thing that I will mention quickly there is, you know, the, the, the U.S. proximity is a blessing in disguise because, I mean, think about this. If you're like a Mexican, you know, a scientist doing the deep tech, $350 yeah. and, and something crazy like, you know, 2,000 flights a, a week, uh, you know, per day or something, the statistics yeah. are amazing, and you're in the U.S. And there is probably right. 25 daily flights from Silicon Valley to anywhere in Mexico. So the connectivity mm -hmm. is just enormous. So, so I'm pretty sure that the U.S. is capturing a lot of that, you know, Latin American or, or, or particularly Mexican talent, and it's something that kind of like just stays there and, and matures there, which, by the way, it, it makes sense if you're doing something in deep, deep tech. I'm not encouraging any Mexican scientists to actually just do it in Mexico if it's a global play, but, but it's just the way it is. How relevant do you think is Silicon Valley to the B2C side of the Mexican venture uh, ecosystem because you're catering to, well, not just Mexican, Latin American, Mexico, Peru, uh, Chile, uh, Colombia, the markets that you've talked about. If you're doing B2C catering to those markets, how relevant is Silicon Valley for you? Uh, I think it's growing in terms of relevance. Uh, you know, it's kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't like to use the word frustrating, but, but I, I really wish that Silicon Valley took a little bit more time to understand Latin America. Um, like mm -hmm. I, I have seen, you know, many entrepreneurs with very, you know, heartbreaking emails going something like, well, you know, we always go for the big market. And for all the big market is Brazil. That makes sense. Brazil has the scale, et cetera. And then from Brazil, we'll try to pursue like a global Latin American play and have the companies expand and everything. That's, that's something really crazy. That's, you know, like, like saying, yeah, we'll go probably to China and Chinese in Asia. And, you know, you know from China, we'll probably go to other markets. I, I, doesn't make any sense. And, and actually, nothing against Brazilian companies. I think they're fantastic entrepreneurs out there. But Brazilians have been very bad at, at scaling companies outside of Brazil. And I will actually there you know how many companies have actually successfully scaled from Brazil into Latin America. I could probably think of one. I mean, Nubank now, the Challenger Bank, has a new opportunity and a lot of money to actually try that. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think that Latin America has to be seen in, in a different way. Uh, and now obviously Rappi and what you mentioned with last mile logistics, you know, it's, it's certainly a hot segment in Latin America and Rappi just raised one billion from SoftBank just towards that, that particular vertical. Uh, but, but the thing is, there's also a big perception on insecurity, right? Yeah, Mexico, of course, the Chapo, broke wash. We all know that. Uh, but the thing is, if you actually go to Mexico City and Guadalajara, you're statistically more safe than even some cities in the U.S. like, uh, you know, unfortunately, Chicago nowadays. Never, needless to but, say, you know, I, to other... Hernan, I think you're, what you're saying is, is correct, that there is not a lot of awareness, but I, I, I'm even asking something uh, a little more fundamental. Do you need Silicon Valley to be successful in what you're trying to do is building the B2C venture ecosystem? SoftBank is interested. SoftBank is not Silicon Valley. SoftBank is a Japanese company with Middle Eastern money. So, I mean, they're yes. interested in a big market. They understand that Mexico and Latin America is a big market, and, and they're willing to work with you. Probably Tiger Global wants to work with you. Probably Naspers wants to work with you. These are the emerging market venture funds that are interested in these bigger emerging markets, and I, I imagine all of them are interested in working with you. So what do you need Silicon Valley for? I mean, that, that, that's, that's actually a, a great point. And, and I will tell you this. Yes, we actually have worked with Temasek, with, uh, with GA, and, and the, exactly. With exactly. Uh, and it's happening. I, I, but I always see this, particularly to Mexico. I was, I was part of the NAFTA generation. And this is something interesting to understand. I was, I was part of the, you know, the whole thing where the U.S. has been as a key ally or something. So 
I don't know. It's kind of like uh, I'm, 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 I, I went to school in the U.S. I have like so many U.S. friends. So I would love to see Silicon Valley, you know, open a little bit more towards like Latin America and, and, and Mexico and, and understand the fundamentals. Yeah, Mexico dangerous is yes. If you go to Reynosa, when are you going to be in Silicon Valley next yes. time? Oh, I go there at least you know once every three months and, and meet with fantastic people and trying to spread the good word and, and hopefully building those bridges. And I agree. I think that the, in terms of money-wise and, and good story to tell, there's now very rare that plays like, like SoftBank that, you know, they have, they have been amazing to some of these companies. Uh, but I, I will not, not lose hope of Silicon Valley. I just hope that next time that they're trying to fund something that, in my humble opinion, might be as trivial as getting an on, like the third app for on-demand ballet service, what would I think something more fundamental that can change people's lives, like, you know, Urban mobility in in packed cities where you really need to solve a problem. I, I I probably would not lose my faith in Silicon Valley in the short term, but you know it's a uh, it's, it's a labor of love. <laughs> well, next time you come, give me a buzz and and we'll uh, we'll have coffee and chat more. <laughs> we will certainly. I will certainly look up look forward to that, Hermana. All right. Well, thank you very much for sharing your perspective. I'm a huge fan of Latin America. I've, you know, spent time in Latin America. I love Latin America, and I'm I'm really thrilled to see, you know, all the things that are happening. We we actually keep in touch with a number of investors in Latin America, and I I worked very closely with Mercado Libre a long time ago. Um, oh, nice. So, no, right, so. by all means, the, 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 the invitation then extends the other way. The next time you come. Uh, this this part of the river or, or the wall, I guess. Uh, please ping us and we'll be happy to take you out for, for some proper tacos and, and meet some pretty interesting people. All right. Take care, Hernan. Thank you for participating today. Very interesting. Thank you, perspective. Sermana. Was no, thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great day, Sermana. Bye bye. <laughs> so, right. We're going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch portion of the discussion today. Um, this is a safe working session. Many of you have been here before. If it's your first time, know that you don't need to be nervous. You don't need to be defensive. This is, we are on your side, and we'll be working on your business, and we'll try to strategize on how to remove roadblocks on your, from your path of progress. Now, if you may disagree with the feedback you get. That's your prerogative. It's your venture. You will do whatever you want to do with it. Just know one thing, not all businesses can raise money, not all businesses should raise money, and raising money doesn't guarantee success. So it seems like Thomas is not able to join, technical glitch. We are going to go to Ravi Tej Yadalam from Bangalore. Ravi Tej, please unmute your line and tell us what you're working on. Hi, Samana. I believe uh, both Navneet and Ravi Tej are on the call, yeah? Yes, Navneet is online as well. Okay, go ahead. So, first of all, good morning and uh, uh, thanks for having us uh, here. Uh, we're really excited about uh, getting your feedback on what we're building. Um, so, we're actually pitching uh, Lightwing today. So, Lightwing is a, is a cloud optimization uh, B2B SaaS product, uh, basically to help companies hosted on the public cloud to save up to 70% or more on their public cloud bills on Amazon, AWS, uh, sorry, on AWS as well, GCP, et cetera. Um, and this is done through uh, scheduling and right sizing. Um, right? So Navneet and I have actually been working uh, together on various products uh, and projects for the last uh, yeah, eight, nine years or so, um, including for my previous ventures. Uh, but they have all primarily been uh, in the B2C space. So we don't have mm -hmm. uh, a whole lot of experience running uh, B2B uh, SaaS uh, companies, et cetera. So we would really like uh, your feedback and advice on that. So, um, so we launched uh, a company called Better Technology Consulting uh, about July last year. Um, so basically mm -hmm. we do uh, technology services. So we do technology consulting, customer application development, cloud enablement, and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so through that experience and including our own personal uh, experience, uh, we found a lot of cloud waste, uh, you, know, we, you know, with uh, the way companies actually manage their cloud and, and their cloud spend on public clouds. So that's when we, uh, the idea for Lightwing actually came about to actually automate these uh, workflows to help companies eliminate that cloud waste. Um, next slide, please. 
so yeah the the uh, situation is fairly simple what we're trying and what we're seeing today is that companies are overpaying for cloud bills um, this obviously means that uh, it wastes a huge amount of cash flows uh, of the companies um, and that means that operating expenses are much higher than they should be and and that means that companies are unable to sort of invest in their uh, their core aspect of the business and in what matters so yeah i mean uh, obviously this is this is a nice rate of statement but uh, you know we've seen that uh, uh, practically impact a lot of companies including our own so we're actually really excited about being part of the, the solution to this um, next slide please so lightwing solves this problem uh, like i said it's it's a it's a simple tool that's fast to use uh, simple to explain and uh, improves cash flows and saves companies um, so Lightwing is actually uh, uh, right now in in its uh, uh, MVP stage. So we started working, we started building this product in March uh, a couple of months ago, but we've been thinking about this problem for about uh, six months now, um, and we launched uh, uh, the MVP last month. So this is a, a more detailed problem statement. So essentially, we're looking at about 14 billion dollars uh, in this year alone in cloud waste. Um, so uh, the statistics are that 40% uh, of uh, all public instances are over-provisioned by at least one size, and the way the uh, cl uh, cloud providers uh, uh, price their uh, price their machines is that if you reduce the size of a machine by just one size, it brings down the cost of that machine by 50%, right? And if you reduce the uh, size of the machine by two sizes, it brings down the price of that machine by 75%. So there's a lot of room mm -hmm. for uh, um, cost savings through right sizing recommendations. The other, on the other hand, for non-production machines, which are development staging and uh, testing environments, um, these are basically machines that require only to be on on a, on the in, in during work hours at best in a given day. Right? So after mm -hmm. work hours on weekends and holidays, uh, they're not required to be alive. Um, so and that accounts for actually 70% of the calendar month when they're actually just just on and unused. So that's another 70% mm -hmm. uh, 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 potential cost saving. Of course, to add to this, it's very complicated uh, pricing that the providers have today. Mm, the other aspect of that is also the, uh, the current uh, tools that are available in the market today. Uh, obviously, I'm sure you're familiar with this. There's so many tools uh, in the market today. Um, and they do a really good job in terms of uh, recommendations for cost monitoring and optimization. Uh, but in our experience, they don't actually help you implement those uh, uh, recommendations. So in our experience, companies are spending a lot of uh, uh, developer resources, time and money to actually uh, build uh, build and maintain code that does what Lightwing does to be able to set automated schedules and, and run right sizing scans and things like that. Um, next Ravi slide. Sage, why do you have this point yeah. about on-premise installation? If you're going for SMEs, and cloud optimization, cloud cost of monitoring and optimization for SMEs, if that's your positioning, yeah. why is on-premise an issue? So, so that actually wasn't there to begin with. But in fact, so we have uh, three smaller customers that are already using it uh, since its launched last month. Uh, one of them mm -hmm. is actually using it uh, on-prem. Uh, so so there they have a spend of roughly about $10,000 a month, uh, 2000 of which is on AWS. Uh, and they, for some reason, required that the the application be uh, deployed on prem on premise uh, uh, with them so so that's that's the provision that we had based on customer requirements you need to we actually didn't have that what this some reason business is because i'm not convinced that that is a good customer to for you to cater to um, right. i think if you're trying to do cloud cost monitoring and optimization with SME mm. customers that are committed to the cloud that want to use the cloud aggressively have lots of cloud services the, right. the fact that somebody wants on-premise on the cloud monitoring side sounds incongruous to me. I don't think this is a customer mm. that is going to aggressively bet on the cloud. So, um, right. so my recommendation to you was, would be to not entertain customers that require on-premise installation. Got it. Sure. Yeah. Next slide. So this is uh, basically our, um, you know, solution to this is a simple cost-effective tool um, and also uh, cost-effective. So the, the tool basically gives companies the ability to set automated schedules uh, to eliminate the 70% of uh, the bill for non-production machines. For example, uh, another customer uh, that's using us uh, is actually using the tool to bring down part of their machines during night times and early mornings, et cetera, when their traffic and usage patterns are much lower. Uh, so that, again, is an automated uh, schedule that they set. 
Another, uh, okay. you know, feature in the tool is uh, is a TTL uh, rule, which basically means that for every uh, machine that is tagged with, say, demo or, or dev, for example, mm -hmm. uh, Lightwing actually brings down those uh, machines automatically uh, after a set period of time, which which obviously eliminates the option of uh, ma people manually forgetting to turn it off and things like that. Um, the other aspect is also in terms of spot instances. Uh, so spot instances is a really effective way to get like up to 90% of uh, savings, which is obviously a little bit uh, complicated to uh, to manage manually. So that's another thing that we're looking to automate on the tool. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. Yeah, so at the, at the moment we're uh, live uh, on AWS. So AWS, Lightning works with AWS, but the way we've actually structured the product we can actually launch a new cloud provider uh, in uh, you know within 10 to 14 days time because we've designed it in a multi multi cloud uh, cloud agnostic architecture uh, we're already uh, you know, um, working on launching digitalocean which will be live uh, by next week uh, including on the marketplace next okay. slide um, yeah so this is just uh, the the market uh, before you take us to task this is not a time analysis so this is just a uh, um, uh, details about uh, about the market. So it's about 10.5 billion is, is the cloud management market uh, uh, as we see today, with a CAGR of 12.6%. Uh, next slide, please. So, so this is our uh, granular time analysis. Uh, so what we've actually done is we've taken the uh, um, you know the revenues of all of these uh, cloud providers, at least these six. We've taken the SMBs uh, contributing to the the number of customers that each of them have, the average ticket size. And then uh, arrived at at the actual time that we can go after. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is a trend that we we've actually seen. Um, in this example, uh, you know, Azure uh, basically has 60% of their customers being uh, smaller long tail customers, which are completely yeah. unserved, not underserved, right? So they're fully unserved. And this is a trend mm -hmm. that we've seen across every single cloud provider that we've seen. And the percentages just get bigger uh, the smaller the cloud provider. So this is uh, something that we've seen as, as a very large gap and also from personal experience. Yeah, so this is a very important point that we don't compete with uh, existing tools out there. Um, that I think is, is not, I mean, it's a very saturated market in terms of the monitoring and uh, optimization tools uh, in terms of giving recommendations. So we don't actually give the recommendations alone. We also help companies uh, have a fast and cost-effective way to implement those recommendations. So in this specific yeah. example, uh, we, we've actually spoken to a, a company in the Valley. Uh, they're a data cataloging company, and they have about a $75,000 a month AWS bill. They already use Cloudability, which is an existing tool, to um, you know monitor their uh, cloud spend. But they are implementing Lightwing uh, in addition to that. Uh, to basically mm -hmm. save uh, about 50% on their non-production machines, which is about $10,000 a month sa uh, a month saving. Um, so, okay. so that's like uh, an example that we have live, where we're not we're working in tandem with an existing tool. So, this is our uh, uh, broad go to ma go to market strategy at the moment. So, the what we've actually we've actually had uh, we've tried to execute on all of these, uh, even though it's just been a month or so. Uh, so one is, of course, through direct sales. We've been able to close three customers through this route. The one customer is a, is a travel app in Bangalore. Uh, they have about mm -hmm. 5 million monthly uh, MAUs. Uh, and another mm -hmm. is a US-based IoT loyalty platform. Um, and so through this, we want to you know, get to our first uh, you know, 40 to 50 customers through our own sort of personal connects and, and uh, direct networking. Um, mm -hmm. The other channel that we're looking at is uh, resellers and MSPs basically uh, software services companies, cloud consultants, and things like that. So even in this, we've, we've had uh, conversations with three different firms who are looking to sort of resell uh, Lightwing to their uh, end customers. Um, okay. the, the, third, uh, type, the third type is actually integrations with uh, third-party platforms. Um, so basically, um, you know, uh, companies that uh, service customers uh, for different uh, products or services around their cloud setup, but not exactly what we do. Um, so we've seen interest from them to say that, you know what, we can uh, use the Lightwing data to sort of uh, act as a, like a cloud dashboard within our tool. Um, so so that, that's another uh, conversation that we're having with two different companies for that, that model as well. Okay. So this is just an example of uh, one of our early customers. Like I said, it's just been a month since we've launched MVP and, and they've already started using us. Uh, so we so far we have one customer testimonial. We, we have hopefully more coming soon. 
Uh, so they have actually uh, been using us for uh, for for about a month or so now since launch, and they've they've been really happy with this. Uh, they've validated mm -hmm. the the point that they would otherwise have uh, missed the spend that we that they've got to likely. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so like I said, we're at uh, three customers now. So our aim is to uh, sort of grow at uh, forty percent in terms of customer acquisition for the next one year. Um, and uh, yeah, so so you know, to get to this scale across the three How do you strategies. How do you achieve this this kind of numbers? What is your customer acquisition strategy? You talked about it a little bit earlier. Is it channel that you think yeah. is going to give you these kinds of numbers? So I think uh, with this, I think uh, through the direct connects that we have, I think we'd, we'd get about 30% of these uh, because you know we've actually reached, we've had over uh, 40 customer conversations and you know product demos and things like that before we actually started building the product. So we've tried to validate okay. uh, the requirement as much as possible. So from that, I think we'll so get, all of those we'll, are we'll get a good convert. chunk. And so that's what we're hoping. And, and every time we've had that conversation, yeah. they've also said that, hey, you know what, why don't you talk to this guy? And like they have this much in cloud spend, and this will be useful for them. So this Very is, good. of course, the best guess, but that, that's how we've arrived at it. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, to our point, basically, uh, like I said, since companies are today using uh, in-house uh, developer resources uh, to build what Lightwing can do, Lightwing is just is basically a way to make that same effort 90% lesser time and money instead of them building and maintaining this in-house, which is non-core. Uh, like I said, we've done validation with uh, with over 40 customers. So mm -hmm. yeah, so so our subscription model is basically 1% of cloud spend. Uh, which we think as our feature set grows, we can uh, grow that to about 2 to 2.5%, which the monitoring tools do at this point. Um, so again, this we, we've sort of looked at various uh, subscription models, and this was what sort of came closest to uh, the value that the tool actually provides. So we've, you know, we've, we've had initial feedback uh, from customers that this is a model that they're willing to go, but I think this is, again, something that we have to constantly validate. Um, yeah, and, and this is uh, uh, also the, the, the growth that we expect um, uh, to see in terms of customers. So you, are, you want to charge 1% of the cloud spend to those customers, and, and whatever you save basically uh, comes out, it, it kind of rationalizes, huh? Not cloud, exactly. not so, cloud so we savings, did... not the savings that you are no. instituting. You want to take it off the top line. Exactly. So, so our first model actually, interestingly, was 10% of cloud savings, right, of cost savings. So we did that. Mm -hmm. We did. We had, uh, in fact, even today, we have uh, we've built in a, a system that gives you very, very granular visibility into savings, down to every schedule that you set, down to every instance that you can see that you've saved this much uh, using Lightwing. Yeah. But uh, you know, repeatedly, we've we've uh, had this feedback that you know what, like every month you're gonna like have uh, issues with. Uh, sort of justifying that, uh, you know, Lightwing actually helped you get these savings and not like somebody switching it off manually and stuff like that. So uh, based on a lot of that back and forth and feedback, we sort of said, I think this uh, is something that makes sense. Again, so we've been able to validate it with our uh, current set of customers, but uh, yeah, I, I think we'll have to validate that a little bit more. So the, the numbers that I am concerned about are these 447 customers, 10,035 customers, 89,470 customers. These are very big numbers. And, uh, right. and I, I haven't yet seen a go-to-market strategy that justifies or, or you know, stands behind those numbers. Okay. So that's right. the, so, that's so the one the, that I would yeah. probe um, and, and really try to get lots of flesh behind. Sure, of course. All right. Yeah. So this is just uh, the landscape in terms of uh, the M&A activity that has happened so far. Uh, the the company that we have the most overlap in terms of features is a company called Park My Cloud. They were actually acquired just last week uh, by a company called Turbonomics. So there's lots of activity that's happening in this space uh, uh, right now. In fact, just this morning we met with uh, one of the investors of uh, of Nutanix who acquired uh, Minja. Um, so uh, his, um, you know, view was also uh, very much the same that there is a lot of, um, you know, uh, M&A activity going on, and this is the he he was also able to validate that the, pro the that the problem we're solving is something very real. Uh, his feedback was that you know in the next year year and a half is when we need to get the maximum amount of traction, um, um, you know, to have uh, a, a good play with uh, some of these companies that might be interested. So I don't see any. Um... 
any mention in your entire presentation about ServiceNow? ServiceNow is a big player in the, um, yeah, you know, infrastructure management, IT infrastructure management space. Right. But you don't seem to have any strategy vis-a-vis -vis them. No. So, I, so what we've only uh, taken into account uh, with the M&A. So, ServiceNow, for example, is a really good uh, company for us to have a conversation once we have traction. Uh, because what we've seen is companies similar to them are the ones who've made acquisitions and, and uh, strategic uh, partnerships. So uh, we, you know, all of those companies are definitely on our radar. I think what we've only tried to mention is if there's any activity that's happened already so far in the market. Well, I didn't see a, a competitive landscape. I see what has been acquired, but what about what? What else is competition out there for you? So at this time, uh, the only company that has, uh, you know, the most overlapping uh, feature set, and we can call a direct competitor, is, is Spark My Cloud. The others are all and sort of, uh, you know, uh, cloud monitoring and optimization tools. And is Spark My Cloud going after SMEs or enterprise? So they're, uh, uh, to our best guess, they're going after enterprise. Okay, that's a good, very good uh, situation. If if you can take it down a little bit and. Um, the question, you know, I, I have to say the go-to-market strategy doesn't ring true for me, and it doesn't certainly not doesn't okay. have enough meat on the bones to be able to justify the kinds of numbers you're quoting. So that's something I would need to work with you on. If you were to be in the program, this is so that would be the right. number one thing that I would drill down on. Right. Sure. Um, so all the rest, yes, absolutely. You know, that's all the things that we do. I'm going to spend a moment to talk about one million by one million and how you can use them. And why don't you listen to that? And you're welcome to ask more questions about that. So yes, all the all questions you're asking, can we help you with? Yeah, those are the things that we do in the program. Perfect. But you probably know so that already. So I just already. had one other. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I just had one other question uh, in terms of uh, using services to fund uh, operation and growth versus, yeah. uh, you know, raising a seed round. Uh, so I, I really wanted your feedback on that because uh, when we started uh, when we started off a couple of months ago, we were very much uh, of the opinion that, you know, and, and of the intention that we do it through services because we are the, you know, technology services firm and we have the capacity to do that. Uh, but the feedback that we got this morning and, and from a couple of others is that, you know, it, it could make sense to sort of just, you know, focus on this uh, much stronger because you'd need to show uh, much faster customer acquisition uh, traction over the next year, year and a half, because that's where the market's at. So I just wanted your feedback on that. So my response to that would be, um, I, if you were working with us, I would need you to get to the financeable stage using services. Yeah. Once you raise money, you can switch off the services. but. We have to get you to that okay. stage, and, and there is this is not quite ready yet. So, um, so of that's course. that's yeah. my answer. I would like to work on your go-to-market okay. strategy, get you to that stage, and start the financing round, and 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 close the financing round before I would recommend that you switch off services. Got it. Perfect. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So hold on for a second. Let me uh, uh, let's get you through a bit of the. Um, you know, description of the program, and you can ask more questions after that. So, folks, sure. um, one thing I would like to uh, like help from you on is getting the word out about one million by one million. If you like what we're doing here, please bring serious entrepreneurs into the program. We do very well with entrepreneurs who have rigor, who have you know the ability to work uh, rigorously, study. Uh, you know, self-learning, use these online sessions to get uh, guidance, but also to do a lot of homework and a lot of intense execution on their end. Um, we are not very good uh, with entrepreneurs who need a lot of spoon feeding. That's really not a good fit with this program. So please be very honest about asking yourself, what is your psychographic as an entrepreneur? And if you have the capacity for self-learning and be you know, very entrepreneurial, so to speak, and you're also in the learning that you do if you're willing to be entrepreneurial and self-motivated, we are a good fit for you. So uh, in terms of resources, you'll find a great blog on the, on the website. You'll find the Entrepreneur Journey's book series. There are 12 volumes. You can study those to get 
uh, you know, get your education process started. These roundtables happen every week. You're welcome to come to as many of them as you like. Pitch, you can study the recordings. They're all available. And the full acceleration program from 1 million by 1 million is 1M by 1M premium. We give you extensive methodology guidance. We have a full curriculum that you'll learn a lot from, and you have a lot of blueprints in the curriculum, in the case studies, that you can very easily mirror around, and that's very effective. Uh, we help you with business development in our network. By joining 1M by 1M Premium, you pretty much have access to our entire Rolodex. And we help you with strategy consulting. These kinds of sessions with private roundtables, you can, add, you can come and talk to me at as many of them as you like. You can talk, come and talk to me every week if you like. Um, we do help you with financing, but we will need to get you to a place, a stage where you're financeable before we introduce you to our investor Rolodex. But you know, if once you get there, you could get introduced in half an hour to 30 investors, and that's nobody, there's nobody else in the world who's going to do that for you. Um, and we also have a lot of clout in the media so we can help you get the word out there about your offering. Go to the 1M by 1M self-assessment on the website and ask yourself these questions. These are very important questions. Investors will ask you these questions. You should ask yourself these questions and pre-qualify so that you know when you go in front of investors, you can defend your investment thesis. If you get stuck, 1M by 1M basic is just $99 a month, curriculum only option. You can start studying. Studying cannot hurt you. Studying is going to help you become a sophisticated entrepreneur, and it's invaluable. The ability to study the curriculum and master as much of it as quickly as possible is going to get you much further in terms of how fast you're going to navigate this entrepreneurial journey. So go to the website, dig around, look at the descriptions of the premium and basic programs, and figure out if this program is for you. The curriculum is described in detail. Um, it is a case studies and video lectures based program. We have over 1,000 successful entrepreneur case studies, including 100 plus unicorns, 400 plus venture funded companies, another 400 plus bootstrapped companies. Our philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later. As you heard, I just advised Ravi Tej to bootstrap using services first, get ready for a seed financing round, and then go out to raise money. And I think that will work fine in his case. Um, and that's often the case, often the recommendation that we have for you. And that's pretty much it. We have one more uh, free roundtable on May 23rd. We have three more in June, 13th, 20th, and 27th. We have rendezvous, uh, we have one more rendezvous left in May, and that's May 22nd, and then I'm traveling for a bit, so we don't have rendezvous until mid-June again. That's it, I'll be happy to take more questions. By all means, uh, ask questions by phone or through the public chat, and uh, you know, tell us what you're thinking, what you what brings you here, what kinds of issues that you're dealing with, and I'll try to answer. While you're doing that, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson. Any questions about the program, Irina will be happy to answer your questions. Anybody, questions, comments, feedback, issues, introductions? This is also a good networking time. Anybody? No? Ravi Tej, are you all set? Did you have any other questions before we uh, adjourn the session? No, I, I, I think I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Uday Kumar is asking pricing strategy for new category of SaaS products. Uday, you are in the premium program, so you have access to the pricing module. So go to the positioning module. And then in a subcategory of positioning, there's a pricing module. You should go look at that, study that, and then start calculating your pricing using that methodology. Have you done that module yet? Okay, so then start applying the pricing module theory that you've learned to your case.
All right. I think uh, we're going to adjourn today, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for calling.